let, let's start and uh, let me uh, first of all uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar, this first webinar in, in a series, we hope and we think that it's necessary, in a series on the impact of Brexit um, upon the legal profession in the Republic of Cyprus, but also we will look at other uh, aspects of uh, Brexit and um, the impacts on uh, the legal profession in the UK and, uh, and, and other areas. So it's a pleasure to have, you know, our speakers, our distinguished guests, uh, colleagues and students with us. It's a pleasure to have uh, practicing lawyers, but also um, young lawyers and, uh, and, and uh, um, students who aspire to become lawyers. And um, that's, that's very encouraging to see that everybody's uh, interesting, interested in this discussion. Um, as I said, it is probably the, the first webinar in a CPD series, which invites us to think all together and reflect on some of the implications of the post-Brexit era on the legal profession in Cyprus and the UK. So before I may introduce the topic, uh, or the topics rather, of tonight in more detail and uh, pass on the floor, I wanted to uh, thank Marco and Clercos again for their willingness to assist. Despite the complexity of the matter, I think that anyone who has uh, looked at uh, the uh, Brexit deal uh, will know uh, what I'm talking about. Despite the distance, Marco is sat in London, uh, and despite the technical constraints, so thank you uh, to both of you and uh, thank you to uh, any, everyone who has joined us. Uh, we very much look forward to it and uh, to meet more participants. So let me remind you that this is a webinar that is recorded. Um, the reason for the recording is that we wish to widen um, access to educational materials like this one. So for us, it's important that there is a trace so that we can it can be treated as educational resources and be made available to young people. So if anyone has not returned yet the consent form or the additional information requested uh, from practicing lawyers who are registered with the Cyprus Bar Association for CPD purposes, then please um, do that in due course so that we can uh, start the process uh, for the CPD uh, registration for the lawyers in particular. Other uh, participants will uh, receive a certificate of participation uh, later on in due course. So, as everyone seems to appreciate it and know it here, please keep your cameras off and your microphones off at all times and make, make use of the chat function uh, in the MS Teams classroom to ask any questions or make comments. I will be monitoring. Now it's a bit difficult because I'm chatting, but as soon as I will stop, I will monitor the chat. Um, so if you do not wish to appear on the recordings, that's fine uh, in the sense that we don't have uh, cameras and, and micros. If you do not wish to appear at all in the recording, then don't make use of the chat function either. Um, Despina has placed, Despina and Andrea have placed on the Microsoft Teams uh, folder a feedback uh, link or feedback form, which I would kindly ask that uh, each and every participant uh, fills in once the webinar is over. Um, also, I would like to remind everyone that each of the speakers and the participants who will participate actively uh, to this webinar we take part for educational purposes, and this is an educational setting. Therefore, whatever each participant will provide verbally, electronically or otherwise must not be accepted or interpreted as either legal advice or any form of advice. You may view materials at your disposal in the Microsoft Teams folder. Uh, you are very uh, welcome to take them away from this webinar, so by downloading them, in other words and use, uh, use them with the necessary acknowledgements. So let me start by uh, trying to brush a, or to paint a, a, a wider picture of, of tonight's topics. Um, I am going to start by saying that uh, we as global citizens, but also law professionals or future law professionals, 
We find ourselves in the eye of the cyclone, uh, stranded between the consequences of the post-Brexit era, the disasters of the pandemic, but also the reform of the legal education and the professional solicitors uh, brought about by the SRA in England and Wales, uh, which all happen to coincide. In this context, uh, it is in this context that uh, a series of issues will be addressed tonight by our two speakers, uh, whom we thank very much. So when I, when Cleafos and I were discussing um, the, the content uh, of, uh, of the EU-UK uh, deal, uh, Cleafos used the word uh, avalanche. And uh, yes, indeed, before the end of, uh, before the close of 2020, uh, there was an avalanche of legal instruments at the EU, but also at the UK level, unfolding. And uh, law professionals must find a way to navigate this legislative jungle and be in a position to advise themselves, first of all, but also their clientele as to what to do uh, post-Brexit. So let me give you just a few points of, uh, I would say, a few milestones of what matters for this uh, webinar. So the main EU-UK uh, legal instrument for our purposes tonight is the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, or otherwise CTA, which covers areas uh, such as trading goods and services, digital trade, intellectual property, public procurement, law enforcement and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, all of those topics being fundamental uh, to lawyers. The EU-UK agreement concerning security procedures for exchanging and protection of classified information is also of relevance to the legal profession. Just bear in mind that some aspects of the withdrawal agreement uh, of 2019 have not been covered in the CTA and other agreements finalized in December 2020. So this is important for everyone to remember. And I think Clear course, is going to make some comparisons, draw some comparisons between the frameworks. So the principles of the CTA are derived from international trade law and the rules of the internal market as negotiated by the European Union on behalf of its member states, because the CTA is deemed to be an EU-only agreement. Uh, these principles are equal treatment, a level playing field, a fair competition and sustainable development achieved through a free trade zone. These principles are aimed to minimize uncertainty and the disruption to businesses and citizens, uh, but also uh, are only applicable to the extent that the integrity of the EU single market, of the EU legal order, as well as of the indivisibility of the four freedoms are not affected. The legal basis of the CTA is Article 217, of the TFEU uh, on the conclusion of international agreements, which requires the unanimous agreement of the member states in the Council and the consent or ratification of the European Parliament. That consent of European Parliament, European Parliament is pending probably until its plenary session in March 2021. So we have a very interesting example of an agreement um, whose entry into application has been acted as a matter of special urgency. It's a provisional agreement which should not give rise to any sort of precedent. So uh, it is already a very interesting area for further uh, commenting and research. In addition to this, the CTA is a quite ambitious free trade agreement uh, entailing commitments for the protection of workers, consumers, the environment, climate change uh, and tax transparency. So it goes further than most free trade areas would, but it remains a free trade agreement. On the 1st of January 2021, the UK lost all the rights and obligations it had as a member state uh, of the uh, European Union and during the transition period under the withdrawal agreement. In particular, apart from Northern Ireland for goods, 
rules of origin, customs formalities and checks and controls are now applicable for goods. But also equivalent principles are applicable for services, capital and people. The free movement of persons, the free movement of services and the freedom of establishment are gone for the UK, including under the EU lawyers directives. Uh, you know the uh, directive, but I give the number here. Uh, it's 249 of 77 and uh, 05 of 98, which are relevant for occasional practice and establishment of lawyers, which means that lawyers with a UK home professional title need, needed to gain approval until the end of the transitional period for full admission to the profession in, in one of the member states of the European Union, if they wish to, like Cyprus, under the Advocates Amendment Law 6 of 2020. This means in effect that uh, UK service suppliers have lost their automatic right to offer services across the EU. They may need to establish themselves in the EU to operate and they must comply with 27 sets of regulatory rules so far, 27 sets, unless and until agreements are reached by national authorities and regulatory bodies in the EU and in the UK to um, harmonize or sort of make converge uh, the host country rules of member states. So that's, that's because UK lawyers do not benefit anymore from the principle of mutual recognition. Based on the principle of non-discrimination and the most favoured nation clause, which uh, emanates from international trade law, uh, EU service providers or suppliers and investors uh, will be treated no less favourably than UK operators in the UK and vice versa. But the lack of country of origin rule, the lack of mutual recognition, and of passporting principles mean that cross-border market access, including in the field of legal services, is restricted. It is restricted, restricted with four different modus operandi. Mode one, for services supplied on a cross-border basis from the home country of the supplier, usually over the internet. Mode two, for services supplied to the consumer in the country of the supplier. Mode three, for services supplied through a locally established business owned by the foreign service supplier. And mode four, for services supplied through the temporary presence in the territory of another country by a service supplier who is a natural person. Cross-border border market access to services on preferential terms is further restricted by general or specific reservations made by member states and recorded in the CTA. As a result, the general principle of the home title practice is limited in some jurisdictions with further restrictions of relevance to partnerships, profit sharing, joint practice, management and ownership of law firms. Mode four of service provision, in other words, the temporary movement of natural persons for business purposes, is somehow facilitated with conditions of entry for short stays that are somehow uh, easier than for long stays. The movement of contractual service suppliers or independent professionals for the supply of services under certain conditions is also facilitated. So you see that there is a whole new jargon for lawyers to master. One of these conditions is visa permits and other controls depending on the length of the stay. Another one, another condition, is the recognition of professional qualifications, which cannot now be automatic to the extent that it was previously, nor taken for granted anymore since it's non-existing for UK professionals. 
As such, following the expiry of the transitional period and pending any sector sectoral additional arrangement for the natural recognition, the mutual recognition of, for instance, legal professional qualifications, Legal and other professionals need to get their qualifications recognized in the relevant country on the basis of national rules applicable to the qualifications of third country nationals. And this is very important. Subject to this, EU and UK lawyers are allowed to provide legal services, that is, legal advice on national and public international law. As, a, as well as provide mediation, arbitration and conciliation services to their clients. EU law is left out of the scope of legal services and is instead incorporated under national law and the home title. Note the possibility under the CTA for the taking of joint recommendations for the recognition of professional qualifications covering the UK and all 27 member states, and the possibility for professional bodies across the EU and in the UK to seek other arrangements on a country to country or bilateral basis. The example of the joint examination scheme between the ICPAC and the ICA of England of Wales for uh, chartered accountants is an example on point subject to the approval by the Cyprus Public Audit Oversight Board of the Republic of Cyprus. This could also include the right to requalification, which does not exist anymore in the UK, apart from a few exceptions between the UK on the one hand and France and Ireland on the other. But what would be subject to a sound, that would be subject to a sound understanding of the new rules of the SRA for the transition from the Qualified Lawyers Transfer Scheme or the QLTS to the Solicitors Qualifying Exam, this key, from September 21 onwards. Further issues come up, such as the scope of digital trade for legal services, the exercise of judicial cooperation in criminal matters, or the lack of provisions covering judicial cooperation in civil and commercial matters, which is subject to a range of Council of Europe instruments and other international law instruments. But let me turn now to our first speaker of the night, uh, Dr. Klearkos Kiriakidis, Assistant Professor and Deputy Head of our School of Law, who will brush up the historical legal reasons why Brexit, Brexit has already had and will have profound implications for the Republic of Cyprus, its judiciary, its legal profession and its community of law students. So thank you, Klearkia, and the floor is yours. Right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for choosing to attend this seminar rather than watching the inauguration ceremony in Washington, D.C. Um, it gives me great pleasure to, have, to feel more important than the President of the United States. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, to be serious, though, um, my objective today is quite straightforward. It's to paint a very broad brush overview as to how uh, Brexit, whatever that means, affects the Republic of Cyprus and its legal profession. I'm going to limit to myself to no more than 25 minutes. And in those 25 minutes, I'm going to uh, focus on why Brexit has had and will have profound multidimensional and long lasting implications for the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, particularly its judiciary, legal profession and community of law students. My focus is going to be on the Republic of Cyprus, uh, which um, falls within 97% of the island of Cyprus, but I'm also going to have due regard to the remnants of the British Crown Colony of Cyprus, known as the, the sovereign base areas. Um, I have to make a declaration of interest. Uh, I have a foot in both camps. Um, I'm a, a, a London-born citizen of the United Kingdom and ex-citizen of the European Union. 
Um, but my uh, my other foot is in the Republic of Cyprus, which is a member state of the, the European Union. I abstained in the Brexit referendum because my attempt at voting online failed. So um, I have uh, uh, I'm, I'm neutral in that sense. I, I, I don't fall into either either camp by virtue of that very simple fact that I failed to vote because the system didn't work. And that, of course, gave me an insight into uh, one of the things that was wrong with the Brexit process. There, were, from what I could see, there was there were procedural defects and forms of unfairness uh, built into the system. I'll, I'll touch upon some of those uh, as the presentation unfolds. Brexit itself is a uh, a problematical term. It um, gained currency in the aftermath of uh, the um, economic uh, catastrophe that befell Greece uh, around about 2012. Brexit is, is, is an English word of Greek origin, believe it or not. Um, on the one hand, it uh, is associated with the concept of Grexit, which was the, the phrase in vogue in 2012 when there was a possibility remote as it turned out, of Greece exiting the uh, Euro area. But of course, the, the root of the word Brexit is ex, which is uh, the ancient Greek word for out. So inter it's interesting that the British have adopted a word of Greek origin to um, associate with the biggest uh, constitutional, legal and economic revolution to affect the United Kingdom since the United Kingdom joined the then European Economic Community on the 1st of January uh, 1973. It's also a problematical term for another reason, because the, the correct constitutional name is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland does not form part of uh, Great Britain, but it does form part of the United Kingdom. So the concept of Brexit is misleading in that sense, because it, um, it gives the impression that we are only dealing with the exit of Great Britain from the European Union. We're, we're discussing the exit of much more than the exit of Great Britain uh, from the European Union. I, I'm going to advance four themes throughout this uh, presentation. I've already made the first one that Brexit has already had and will have profound multidimensional and long lasting implications across the island of Cyprus. Uh, secondly, uh, Brexit, I would suggest, affects the Republic of Cyprus more than any of the 27 uh, remaining member states of the European Union, with the probable exception of Ireland. Thirdly, contrary to one of the warnings I issued back on the 12th of October 2017, multiple agreements and other texts were published and, as I put it back in 2017, predicting this, uh, dumped on people at short notice. Uh, and that occurred during the last nine days of the transition period. I'm going to pinpoint some of those texts in a moment or two. Remember, the United Kingdom exited the European Union at 2300 Greenwich Mean Time on the 31st of January 2020. We had a transition period which came to an end at 2300 hours Greenwich Mean Time on the 31st of December 2020. And it was in the last nine days very Mediterranean style, everything was left to the last minute and one document after another was dumped on us and everyone else in the EU and the UK for that matter uh, at almost the last minute. And finally, uh, this is the fourth theme, Brexit has given rise to multiple ambiguities, uncertainties and questions, but also opportunities. And in the Republic of Cyprus, judges, members of the legal profession, law students and others must respond accordingly because as i want to make clear there are both uh, challenges ahead but also opportunities let's just remind ourselves of a fundamental set of principles whether we are in favor of, of the european union or not i think those of us who believe in democracy and the rule of law can have little qualms with or few no qualms with the, the fundamental uh, values of the european union they're set out in article two uh, the European Union. Can I just pause? Somebody, I think, has turned their microphone on by accident. Can you she... please, oh. hello, can you please switch off your camera and mute your microphone? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is just a reminder as to what the civilizational values of uh, democracy amount to. Uh, the European Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, 
and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. Th those are values that are embedded in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. What struck me throughout the, the Brexit process was that lip service was paid to Article 10.3, under which every citizen shall have the right to participate in the democratic life of the Union. Decisions shall be taken as openly as, and as closely as possible to the citizen. Well, I want you to think about how closely you felt as if you were to the decision-making processes that unfolded during Brexit. Um, that's something that we can discuss afterwards. Um, Stephanie has helpfully drawn attention to some of what's on this slide, but this is a very, very brief uh, legal history of the entrance of the United Kingdom to the European Economic Community back in 1973 and its exit in 2020. You will see there that there is a, um, a rash of legislation and uh, uh, EU-UK treaties and agreements that uh, have affected the process in the sense that confirms that the European Union rests on the rule of law. Everything that it does is, uh, is or is supposed to be in line with the law and legal agreements. And the United Kingdom, uh, through its domestic legislation, has mirrored that that dedication to the rule of law, at least on paper. We came very close to being to derailing ourselves in the United Kingdom through this internal market bill when, there were, when it looked as if there might have been a no deal second phase of Brexit. But that uh, fortunately didn't come to pass. But there we go. That's the, uh, the legal history. And you can see why it's impossible really in 25 minutes to do anything more than give you a broad brush overview as to how uh, Cyprus is affected and what these instruments uh, provide. Uh, one thing, it's a couple of points to make here. Uh, the then Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas, on the 26th of June 2017, uh, described Brexit as probably amongst the biggest peacetime issues that the UK has ever faced and without doubt the most complex in legal terms. Uh, given the extent of European Union law and its integration into domestic law since 1972, the task is enormous in scale. And, and I would suggest that task is as, a, as difficult for lawyers in the Republic of Cyprus as it is for lawyers in the United Kingdom. And I'll explain to you some of the reasons today. And one of the reasons is that, that the documentation itself is not only multiple, but intensely complex. Uh, I, I, uh, I rather, I remember listening to this live on the floor of the House of Commons, watching this uh, from Cyprus. Uh, Geoffrey Cox, QCMP, the, the then Attorney General, warned the House of Commons on the 15th of January 2019, we should not underrate, we should not underestimate the legal complexity of our disentanglement from 45 years of legal integration since accession in 1973. 45 years of legal integration have brought our two legal systems, i.e. those of the UK and the EU, into a situation where they are organically linked. To appeal to those who have a medical background, it's the same as, as if we were to separate from a living organism with all of its arteries and veins, a living organ, a central part of this body politic. We cannot underestimate the complexity of what we are embarked upon doing. Uh, when I was teaching this to my students, I drew the analogy with a human face. If you if you treat my human face as the, as the member member states of the European Union as a block, uh, my um, uh, left eye from the right, as you see it, constitutes Great Britain, uh, and the northern part of my other eye constitutes Northern Ireland. And what Brexit has involved is is extracting this eye from my body, and the northern part of my other eye. From this part of the body in a way uh, that ensures that neither the eye on this side or part of the eye on this side dies or the rest of the e of the rest of the body dies that's what they were trying to do they were trying to uh, extract the united kingdom from the body politic of the european union in a way that did as little damage as possible and that's why this concept of a no deal Brexit was so dangerous and why some of us uh, were hostile to the concept of a no deal Brexit, because we could see that it had the potential to do enormous harm to everybody. Thankfully, that didn't come to pass. And what we have instead is this, this com complex situation whereby Brexit has had 
far-reaching implications. Now, for the lawyers uh, in the audience and the law students, Brexit affects multiple areas of law. I remember Stephanie discussing this when she was interviewed on, I think it was BBC Radio 4, she made the point. So this is an expanded version of what Stephanie has said. Um, uh, Brexit affects public international law. It affects European Union law, which is uh, a category of, of public international law. It affects the domestic law of the United Kingdom. But the problem is we don't have a block of UK law. We have now law that affects England, law that affects Wales, law that affects Scotland, and law that affects Northern Ireland. And then in the island of Cyprus, we have the domestic law of the sovereign base areas, we have the domestic law of the Republic of Cyprus, uh, we have the de facto, um, in inverted commas, laws in the occupied area, we have the uh, the buffer zone and the UN administration there, and then everyone else in the EU is affected. The point I want to make is that Brexit requires judges, lawyers and law students in the Republic of Cyprus to change their mindset with de when dealing with any legal matter relating to the UK or the SBAs. Brexit is a, is a legal game changer. We have a, a new set of legal texts to grapple with. And those texts are not neatly set out in one deal, that phrase that was uh, used during the Brexit process. There's no such thing as a deal in one document. We're talking here about multiple documents spread across multiple different jurisdictions. And depending upon the circumstances, uh, the lawyer has to advise the client with due regard uh, to those documents and texts. That's the point that I was making a moment or two ago. We have particular problems in the Republic of Cyprus and the island of Cyprus generally, because we're dealing here with uh, four de facto or de jure jurisdictions. The, the Republic of Cyprus jurisdiction, the sovereign base areas jurisdiction, the, uh, the UN uh, administration in the buffer zone, and then we've got the Turkish occupied north of the Republic of Cyprus. So we've got four separate entities uh, to think about in the Republic. And to make matters more complicated, the Republic of Cyprus has a de facto, uh, not a, it's not de facto, but there's a pocket of territory that's trapped in the southeast. Uh, you can only reach uh, uh, Brodara uh, and Ayanaba and Baralimni through crossing the, um, the Geya sovereign base area. And this is just an example of how Brexit uh, has caused problems because there was a special regime in place from accession, the accession of the Republic of Cyprus in 2004. And that special regime is now being effectively replaced with a, with a new regime, which is rather similar, but it has a few oddities uh, and, and, and differences. Uh, an additional complication is that the United Kingdom has never joined the Euro area, the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, arguably mistakenly, did join the euro area and the sovereign base areas are not de facto euro in the, in the euro area, but they de facto use the, uh, the euro as the de facto currency of the sovereign base area. So there we have it. The euro symbolizes the complexity that the Attorney General was talking about in the House of Commons. So we have the, let me just, I don't know if you can see this from a distance, but there is the original version of the the UK EU withdrawal agreement. This is the first of the texts that we, we need to briefly touch on. This one is dated October um, 2019. And uh, this was the one that uh, Theresa May couldn't push through the House of Commons. She was toppled as leader of the Conservative Party and thus as Prime Minister. Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. He renegotiated the terms of the, the Ireland and Northern Ireland Protocol and it, and it eventually passed through the House of Commons, uh, the rest of the House of Parliament, and it, it's now enshrined in law, in both EU law and the domestic law of the United Kingdom. And now this is now fully in force with the end of the, the transition period. Um, so that the EU-UK withdrawal agreement is the first document you will need to be familiar with. It's a grand total of 1,246 pages. So don't expect me to say much more than the fact that it's very long and very tricky. The, it's subdivided into a, a number of parts and protocols. The protocol that concerns us, look at the wording here, the protocol relating to the sovereign base areas of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland in Cyprus. Um, 
I'm, I'm not going to comment on that other than to say that's one of three protocols, the others being uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar. Uh, those protocols relate to the territories around the world which share a border or boundary with um, territory over which the UK asserts sovereignty. So the Ireland, Northern Ireland uh, protocol deals with the special regime uh, in the island of Ireland where the the state of Ireland is situated alongside uh, Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK. The Gibraltar uh, Protocol deals with the bit of, of the Iberian Peninsula over which the UK asserts sovereignty, and that shares a border with Spain. And the sovereign base areas, if we use the terminology of 1960, share boundaries with the, the Republic of Cyprus. So there we go. That's one of the major reasons why the uh, Brexit is so complex, but it's of huge importance to uh, the Republic of Cyprus. A second reason why Brexit is so important to the Republic of Cyprus is, according to the Office for National Statistics in the UK, the Republic of Cyprus has the highest concentration of British citizens in the EU. 2.9% of the population of the Republic of Cyprus holds only British citizenship. I declare an interest, I'm one of that 2.9% of the population. Uh, and of the 27 EU member states, the Republic of Cyprus has the largest numerical number of UK born migrants. I fall into that category as well. So you can see here, those are just two reasons, two demographic reasons why the Republic of Cyprus is so heavily affected by Brexit, more so uh, perhaps than any other uh, member of the EU with the exception of Ireland. There's another reason why the Republic is heavily affected. The UK is Cyprus's second most significant uh, trading partner with halloumi cheese and potatoes being uh, streets ahead of, of the other exports from the Republic. Uh, to the e, uh, to the UK. So let's turn to the withdrawal agreement. It has uh, a number of provisions, including those concerning the citizens' rights. That's to say, the rights of UK citizens in the EU and EU citizens in the UK. This is a divorce agreement, so there are provisions on separation, financial provisions, institutional and other provisions. So this, if, if you treat it as a divorce agreement with all the, uh, without the children, um, that's the, uh, the way to, to, to understand the, the withdrawal agreement. Um, I won't go into the protocol in any detail other than to draw your attention to the fact that the SBA protocol has 13 articles covering issues such as customs. So the, uh, the SBA's are part of the, or remain rather, part of the customs territory of the EU. There are provisions on taxation, duty relief, social security, agriculture, and so on. Interestingly, uh, Article 7 refers to the external borders of the sovereign base areas. That is the phraseology that originally appeared in 2003, 2004, when the Republic joined the EU. I've never understood why the Republic of Cyprus didn't stick to the terminology of uh, the 1960 agreement that referred to boundaries, but there we go, that's uh, the terminology that uh, that has been uh, incorporated. What they mean is the, it's the immigration, I think what they mean is the immigration controls uh, and other, other controls that take place on the boundaries of the sovereign base areas. Um, I issued a warning, I'm just going to look at the time, I've got five minutes left. I issued a warning when I when I sent a, a written um, piece of evidence to the House of Lords Constitution Committee, which was kind enough to publish back on the 12th of October 2017. I just want to draw attention to what I warned about, because this was completely ignored. Um, I, I, I said that the, the, the way in which this the Brexit was being uh, dealt with at the time in a rather opaque way has the potential to damage UK Republic of Cyprus relations. Republic of Cyprus sovereign base areas relations and the interests of individuals. The risk of such damage, I'm on the second paragraph here, the risk of such damage occurring will be enhanced if any Brexit related deals are struck in secret in the absence of any prior consultation exercises conducted in the island of Cyprus and in circumstances where any deals are dumped on people at short notice. This is precisely what has happened with adverse and long-term consequences on so many occasions in the history of the island where the roots of democracy of the root and the 
democracy and the rule of law are neither deep nor steady. So back then I warned that we shouldn't have a, a situation like we had in 1878 or, or 1960 where deals are cooked up in secret and then dumped on everyone without much notice. And yet this is exactly uh, what happened. We had a transition period that began on the 31st of January uh, 2020. It wasn't due to end until the 31st of December 2020, and we had to wait until the 24th of December for, in the words of the Prime Minister Johnson, for the deal to be done. The deal is done. Now, the word deal there, I want you to just notice, it's a nice, simple word, but let's have a look what it means. It means the following. It means multiple agreements and other texts. By the way, these texts were all published, and I'm going to show you, they're all published in the last nine days of 2020, and several of them came into effect or came into application um, at the very end of the transition period. Um, and all this was happening at a time when the pandemic was taking a turn for the worse in the United Kingdom and indeed in, in, in uh, other parts of, of Europe. So I'm just going to race through these. I don't have time to analyse them today. In the sovereign base areas, the implementing legislation applying the uh, protocol in the original uh, UK-EU withdrawal agreement, that was published on the 23rd of December 2020. So those of you who are lawyers with clients who have dealings with the sovereign base areas or trade in and were out of the sovereign base areas might want to have a look at that. The EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement that Stephanie mentioned as chair that um, was published on the 26th of December and only published in the official journal of the European Union on the 31st of December right at the last minute very Mediterranean I want to stress this we associate with the Mediterranean with leaving things to the last minute well here the British and the authorities in Brussels left things to the last minute that's what the um, uh, trading cooperation agreement embodies it embodies seven parts on things as important as trade, transport, fisheries, law enforcement, judicial cooperation, health security, cyber security, uh, financial provisions, and so on. Um, there, yes, let me just, Stephanie, can I just be given three more minutes before I close? I'm, I'm coming to, I'm inching towards the of end. Of course, you are here. You can take as much as you want. I'm also I'll, timing. Don't worry. I'll just, I'll just take another three or four minutes. What struck me about the EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement was that uh, it, it, there, there is an omission that is either accidental, in which case there's been negligence at play here, or it's intentional, in which case one has to ask the question, why is it intentional? Um, when one looks at the territorial scope of the EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement, uh, one sees express references to Guernsey, Jersey, and the Island Man. Those are the Crown dependencies that are not part of the UK, but are under UK sovereignty. So the agreement applies to those Crown dependencies. The agreement, however, shall neither apply to Gibraltar nor have any effects in that territory. So there's an express reference to Gibraltar. And then it turns to the other British overseas territories scattered around the world. And there's a reference to Anguilla, Bermuda, British Antarctic Territory, British Indian Ocean Territory, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Falkland Islands, Montserrat, Pitcairn, etc., etc., etc. From what I can see, the only British overseas territory that's missing are the sovereign base areas in the island of Cyprus. So I asked the question, now, sooner or later I'll, I'm going to send an open letter to the British government, the Cyprus government, the European Commission to ask the very obvious question, why have the sovereign base areas been omitted? Is that an accident, in which case the accident may have to be addressed, or is it intentional? And if it's intentional, what is the intention underlying uh, the omission? I had to look at the agreement about 20 or 30 times to make sure my eyes were not deceiving me. So that's a very important point. I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, what, you can argue it both ways as to whether clause one impliedly applies to the SBAs or doesn't apply to the SBAs. But the question is why create this uncertainty? 
There are certain reservations that are plot that uh, have been inserted into the agreement, which you can all read in your own time. I'm not going to. I don't have time to go into them. Here are the other agreements, though, that were published in the last nine days of uh, 2020. We have the UK EU agreement concerning security procedures, the EU uh, UK agreement for cooperation on the safe and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Very important for us here in the Republic of Cyprus because we have a Russian built nuclear reactor under construction on the southern coast of Turkey at Akoyu in a seismically active region that is capable of being uh, adversely affected by earthquakes. So I would have expected that agreement to have been uh, publicized in the Republic of Cyprus with its implications for our part of the world uh, properly explained. I don't think that happened. A number of declarations were issued, that's point five. A decision was made by the European Council, which was effectively innate, what we would call in the enabling it was, it was the provision that then enabled the, um, uh, these, these agreements to pass into EU law. Stephanie's more of an expert on EU law than I am, so she might be able to explain to us what, what that amounts to. Then we have guidance documents. So a, a lot of this uh, affects real people. It affects lawyers and their clients. So we had this avalanche of guidance documents published or updated on the 31st of December. I've given you here some of those relating to us. Now, to its credit, the British High Commission was warning UK citizens living in the EU to get their paperwork in order with the SC and with the immigration authority. So I have to place on record my gratitude for that guidance. But that doesn't excuse the fact that so many UK government guidance documents were dumped on us at the last minute, giving us little or no time to prepare properly for the start of the post a transition period at 2300 hours on the 31st of December 2020. And you can see here that the, these guidance documents, people must have been working through their Christmas holidays uh, to update these documents so that at least they would be in the public domain uh, in time for the official uh, post Brexit epoch, sorry, post transition period epoch. So you can all look at these in your own in your own time. <coughs> especially if you have clients, for example, that are engaging in the export of, of goods to the UK from the Republic. Uh, there are some uh, documents to do with the recognition of professional qualifications. So I, won't, I won't touch on that because Marco is going to discuss that later. Oh, and yes, and, and the cherry on the cake was on the 31st of December, we had the EU UK, uh, sorry, not the EU UK, the UK Turkey Free Trade Agreement. That was dumped on us at the last minute as well with some interesting uh, provisions I don't have time to look at. Um, Dominic Grieve QC was a former uh, Attorney General. He was associated with the pro-EU uh, uh, camp in the House of Commons, but he said something I, I rather liked. This was back in November 2018. Is not the lesson of this long negotiation that when you try to unravel yourself from an international rules-based system because you do not like the rules, Unless you want chaos, you start creating a completely new set of rules, many of which are in fact as binding and onerous on this country, the UK, as any that we had before. And I think that um, avalanche of documents I've shown you <laughs> illustrates the point that Mr. Greve QC uh, was making. Here is, oh, here's even more guidance that was published on the 12th of January. These, this is to do with family law. So those of you who have clients who are in, in, about to divorce or in the process of divorcing or have already divorced and there are um, child maintenance issues or family um, finance uh, arrangements in place already, you might want to have a look at this. Uh, this is guidance on UK EU cross-border divorces. And the guidance, however, only applies to England and Wales. So if you're interested in finding out what's happening in Scotland or Northern Ireland, you have to look elsewhere. Um, and there we go. You can look at all that in your own time. But that's just an example of, of how rushed this whole process has been. Uh, final couple of points before I close. Uh, if we look at what was happening in Ireland, there was a, a concerted, well-organized, well-financed and um, well publicized campaign by the Irish government to get Ireland Brexit ready. The Irish government was repeatedly 
publishing or updating uh, readiness action plans for Brexit, guidance documents aimed at, at the Irish public and Irish businesses, highlighting both the risks and the opportunities that were available. I just asked a very simple question. Did the government of the Republic of Cyprus follow the example set by the government of Ireland? Well, in my experience, the last nine days of 2020 were rather similar to the other days that we've seen in recent times. The, the priority of the, the government of the Republic of Cyprus was elsewhere, understandably on the pandemic, but I would suggest that the government should have done much, much more. I'm being very diplomatic here. The Cyprus government should have done much, much more to prepare the public and the private sectors in the Republic of Cyprus for, for Brexit. That regrettably didn't happen. And it's now down to uh, us uh, as academics and you as lawyers to uh, do the best that we can in the circumstances. The sovereign base areas didn't do much either to highlight uh, what was happening with Brexit. Their, their minds uh, were elsewhere too. Uh, just, a, just a couple of final points, uh, if I may. Brexit is not going to affect, as far as I can see, the eligibility of Republic of Cyprus citizens to apply to the uh, Judicial Appointments Commission to serve as judges in England and Wales. Of course, there are various procedures and immigration rules that uh, are now going to come into, pl uh, come into play. But in principle, uh, Commonwealth citizens, including citizens from the Republic of Cyprus and Malta, have traditionally been eligible to apply to join the judiciary and we've also commonwealth not we i'm not a i'm not a republic of cyprus citizen but republic of cyprus citizens are eligible to um uh vote in the united kingdom if they're resident in the united kingdom so that that's uh, not going to change with brexit i don't think and i finished the slide projection with some reading material from the excellent house of commons library which has published a series of briefing papers that have tried to summarize all of this complex material and there are some websites from the uh, SBAs, the European uh, Commission, uh, the European Council, the UK government, the Law Society, the Solicitors Regulation Authority and the Bar Council which help uh, to demystify all of this complexity and those are my publications on Brexit and I, I end where I began. Brexit has already had and will have profound, multidimensional and long lasting implications for the Republic of Cyprus and the adjacent sovereign base areas. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Clarke, for this very um, complete brush up of the situation and confirmation of what we all know uh, already, the legal complexities and how we actually um, deal with those legal complexities in, in practical terms. And as you said, we academics and lawyers can only do our very best to try to follow developments. For the many people who joined us uh, during the chair's briefing or during uh, Cleacos's uh, intervention, just a reminder of, um, the resources that are on available on the MS Teams folder. So if you go to files, you will find a number of resources uh, for this webinar, including the presentation by Claire Hoss that you just saw now, a number of resources made available by Marco, which is very helpful. Uh, I have gone through each and every of them and it's extremely helpful and updated as much as it could be updated. Um, I, there is also a, a paper which I, I um, well, it's not a published paper, but it's a, for a conference. It's a conference paper on some of the aspects that Cleacos touched upon. So it's an analysis of the withdrawal agreement uh, from the point of view of the Republic of Cyprus and uh, territories and uh, territorial jurisdictions in the Republic of Cyprus, which you may take away with you with uh, acknowledgements if you are going to utilize it and uh, you also have information on the school of laws activities past activities and programs if you are interested now without any further ado we will give the floor to marco so uh, we are very very happy and honored to have marco with us and i hope we are not placing too much burden or pressure on your shoulders 
so Marco Cilari uh, is International Policy Advisor for Europe at the Law Society of England and Wales. So it's exactly the person we needed to talk to us. Um, so Marco is going to zoom in uh, the post-Brexit regulatory position of practicing lawyers in England and Wales uh, and in Cyprus and uh, other parts of the European Union. Will talk to us about the SRA uh, reform to legal education and the requalification routes. And then the floor will be open for questions. Thank you very much, Marco. You have 25 minutes. If you need more time, just let me know. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Seven. And hi, everyone. Um, I guess, first of all, I also have to declare an interest. Uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I am not British. Uh, um, I was born in Italy, in Rome. Uh, moved to the UK about five and a half years ago. So I'm afraid that after ClearCourse excellent British accent, you're stuck with my Italian accent, which I'm told is still pretty strong after all these years. Um, obviously, Brexit has had, um, well, I guess, personal impact on me in many respects. Um, I was really involved in uh, in the in the campaign around the Brexit referendum. I guess I should leave that aside now because I'm here as a representative of the Law Society of England and Wales, so very much representing the uh, legal profession in England and Wales here. But obviously, all these topics have continued to be part of my work, especially since I joined the Law Society about a year ago. Uh, as Stephanie said, I'm international policy advisor here at the Law Society, and I'm responsible for Europe in particular. This means that I look after our international relations with uh, European bars, uh, law societies, and uh, and other stakeholders. And I also support uh, UK solicitors and law firms who operate in the EU. Which means, obviously, Brexit has been uh, pretty much all I've been uh, dealing with in the last few months, and it's likely to be for the remain for the for the next few months, if not years. We'll see. Um, so, um, before I begin addressing the two topics that Stephanie described, uh, so one is the impact of Brexit. Uh, on the practicing rights of Cypriot and EU lawyers in England and Wales. The other one is the changes introduced by Brexit to the requalification routes available to EU lawyers um, who want to requalify solicitors. And then I guess connected to this is the reform introduced by the SRA and the introduction of the SQE. And I'll, I'll come to that uh, later in my presentation. Before I get to this, though, I, just to make sure um, everyone understands a few of the uh, names and acronyms I will be referring to. Um, I just want to give a very brief introduction on the legal system in the UK. When we talk about there is no such thing, first of all as a UK legal system. The UK, as you probably know, is divided into uh, four nations, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And it is divided into three jurisdictions. So three legal systems. England and Wales are the same, and that's why we're called the Law Society of England and Wales, because we represent lawyers in England and Wales. Then we have Scotland and Northern Ireland. There is one more distinction, division to, to draw, and I apologize if this is obvious to, to some of you, but I thought it was important just to make clear what we're talking about here. And that's the distinction between solicitors and barristers. Barristers are called advocates in Scotland and barristers in England and Wales and in Northern Ireland. Now, the Law Society of England and Wales represents solicitors of England and Wales. This might look quite specific, but you have to think about the fact that um, lawyers in England and Wales represent about 90% of all lawyers in the UK. And uh, there are about 200,000 solicitors in England and Wales compared to about, according to the most recent figures I've got, uh, 18,000 barristers. So we'll still represent quite a big chunk of the um, legal services sector in the UK. Um, I could go a little bit more into the details of the distinction between the profession of solicitor and that of barrister, but I probably leave that for the Q&A if there are any questions on, on that point. Uh, um, a lot of what I say will be true of uh, both uh, solicitors and barristers in England and Wales, probably will be true of the other jurisdictions in the UK as well, but I confess I'm not that much of an expert in that. So let's just say that what I say um, 
concerns England and Wales in particular, which again covers 90% of the legal profession in all of the UK. Um, some of what I say, particularly when I refer to the SQE and the qualification process, pertains to the solicitor's profession. Um, so I'm, again, I'm less of an expert of what happens if you want to requalify as a barrister. But again, 200,000 solicitors in England and Wales compared to 18,000 barristers. So again, this is a large chunk of the legal profession in, uh, in England and Wales and indeed the UK. Um, another thing, another distinction that is important to bear in mind, it's even more complex than that. Um, in England and Wales, for the solicitor's profession, there are two bodies which are important. One is the Law Society of England and Wales. The other one is the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, which I will be calling the SRA, using the acronym for it. Um, as the name says, the SRA regulates the profession, whereas the Law Society represents the interests of the legal profession. Sometimes we work together, but it's very important, and according to the Legal Services Act of 2007, that the regulator and the representative body are distinct and separate in England and Wales. Okay, so that's it for the general introduction, which gives you a sense of, uh, of, I guess, the complexity of the of the legal profession in the UK, even before Brexit. All this is made obviously even more complex as a result of what happened at the end of December last year, which obviously was the result of a long process, as clear cause um, helpfully explained. Um, essentially, I'm going to cover a very specific uh, issue in relation to Brexit, which, as I said at the beginning, is the impact on EU lawyers who want to practice in England and Wales, either on a temporary or a permanent basis. I'm going to cover this specific topic in the first part of my presentation, and then I'm going to go on to discussing paths to requalification as solicitors in England and Wales. Um, so, as, as Clear Cross explained, um, the transition period, which began on the 31st of January 2020, ended on the 31st of December 2020. Now, as far as the legal profession is concerned, uh, the biggest change happened indeed at the end of last year, so 31st of December 2020. This is because at that point, the UK left the EU Single Market and Customs Union, and uh, that meant that the well, EU legislation, regulations, and directives no longer apply to the UK. For the legal services sector, there are this means in particular three things that are very relevant, which is the fact that three particular EU directives no longer apply to the UK. And Stephanie mentioned um, what they are. The Lawyer Services Directive on 1977, the Lawyers Establishment Directive on 1998, and the Recognition of Professional Qualifications Directive of 2005. Um, now, there are a number of consequences associated with this. Um, the fundamental one for our purposes um, is that as of the 1st of January this year, EU lawyers, any EU lawyer, um, is no longer able to register as a registered European lawyer, and I will be using the acronym REL in England and Wales. So the REL list no longer exists in England and Wales as a result of the fact that the UK has left the single market and customs union. Um, now, to, to be completely accurate, I have to say that the REL list uh, actually still exists, but only in relation to Swiss lawyers which is quite ironic since Swiss, obviously, lawyers are not EU citizens, not EU lawyers, but it still exists because there is a bilateral agreement uh, which the UK and Switzerland signed in 2019, uh, which is called the Citizens' Rights Agreement, uh, uh, which resulted in the fact that essentially, and again, there is some irony to it, but Swiss lawyers can still register as registered European lawyers in England and Wales, but no other um, EU lawyers, no EU lawyers can. Now, obviously, the same is true of UK solicitors. If they practice in any EU member state, they can no longer register there as um, registered European lawyers or the local equivalent, which is some member states is called um, e-list, EU lawyers list, uh, or similarly. Now, the good news for EU lawyers wishing to practice in England and Wales is that they have actually retained all their key practicing rights. 
there are obviously some changes affecting them, but as far as their key practicing rights are concerned, they have actually retained them in spite of the fact that they are no longer able to register as REL's in England and Wales. Um, I will go a little bit more into the details of what this means. Um, but one point which is very important to stress for me as a representative of the Law Society here today is that I would say very much unlike what has been the dominant political stance in British politics over the last few years, um, we're very keen to stress that, that as far as the legal services market in England and Wales is concerned, ours is and will remain an open jurisdiction to foreign lawyers, including European lawyers. And this is very important to us as a law society of England and Wales. We do believe strongly that European lawyers have made an enormous contribution to making the UK and particularly the English legal market what it is, the largest legal market in Europe and the second largest in the world. And we believe that this will continue to be the case. So we, it will be our commitment to make sure that no significant barriers are put up as a result of Brexit for European lawyers in England and Wales. Um, let's go a little bit more into the details of what I mean by this. Um, now, obviously, one thing that I cannot ignore, even though when we when I agreed to speak today, this wasn't in place yet. One thing that I cannot ignore as part of this presentation is obviously that there is a EU UK uh, trade and cooperation agreement that Stephanie and Claire Cross referred to. Um, now, what I'm going to say about it um, uh, is going to be very limited on the provisions specifically on legal services in the agreement. Obviously, the agreement is very long, uh, more than 1,200 pages, and there is a section which is small compared to the size of the deal, but is still immensely relevant that covers legal services. Um, now, the section on legal services in particular is um, um, Section seven in Chapter five of the um, of the trade, transport, fisheries, and other arrangements part of the deal. Um, as I said, it, it's not uh, a, a long uh, section, uh, but it is significant because, in a way that wasn't covered by previous EU agreements, um, these parts of the EU UK TCA. Um, enshrines, in a way, in a trade agreement, the principle of home country title practice. Um, now, we're still working alongside our European counterparts to assess exactly what this means in practice, in the sense that this deal will need to be uh, looked at, um, also taking into account the national reservations, which are essentially exceptions that each EU member state, and indeed the UK, are able to to, to put into the agreement in the annexes of the agreement um, and uh, limit the general principle in the core body text of the agreement. But now again, limiting the agreement um, on the impact that it has on EU lawyers in England and Wales, um, the agreement has um, in, uh, um, in section seven of chapter five said, um, particularly in article serving 5.49, a commitment by each party, uh, the parties being the UK on one side and the EU 27 member states on the other, to allow a lawyer of the other party to supply in its territory designated legal services under that lawyer's home jurisdiction professional title. Um, designated legal services are defined as uh, uh, legal services that pertain to a lawyer's home country law and to public international law with the exclusion of union law. Um, now, as I said, obviously the deal in itself uh, doesn't mean much if we don't look at, well, one, what reservations each member state and the UK have scheduled, two, the way each member state interprets the deal and what it means as far as uh, their national legislation is concerned. Now, I'm just gonna focus on the UK here the UK has not scheduled any significant reservation to this general commitment. And also, you have to remember that the TCA uh, only contains what we would call a baseline. So, um, sort of uh, general commitments that um, the contracting parties 
are committed to to obviously uh, sticking by, but it is possible for each of them to go beyond what they committed to in the deal. And this is very much the case in England and Wales, because the UK has committed to allowing home title practice uh, in the jurisdictions of the UK. But actually, what is permitted to EU lawyers and what will continue to be permitted to any foreign lawyers in England and Wales goes well beyond that, because they can and will continue to be able to advise not just on home country law, so Cypriot law, but also on EU law, international public law, uh, but even English and Welsh law uh, with certain restrictions that I will touch upon um, in, in a second. So this means that um, any EU lawyer wanting to practice in England and Wales can continue to do so with certain restriction only when it comes to advising on certain areas of English law. Uh, now, the activities that are restricted are what we call the reserved activities. Um, these are mainly six reserved areas of the law. When I say reserved, I mean that the, these can only be practiced, can only be uh, advised upon by qualified solicitors. Now, I don't plan to go into the details of these six reserved activities unless there are questions in the Q&A um, section, because I'm very conscious of time. Um, I'll, ju I'll just name them. The main one being obviously the exercise of a right of audience in the courts uh, and certain tribu tribunals in England and Wales. So if you want to appear before a court and exercise litigation, that's the second reserved activity, the conduct of litigation, you have to be a qualified solicitor. Um, other reserved activities are reserved instrument activities, probate activities, notarial activities, and the administration of oaths. Again, I'm not going to go into this or what this means unless there are questions later on um, in, in, uh, in the webinar today. Um, this means that if you do not operate in any of these areas, you do not need to be qualified as a solicitor in England and Wales in order to advise clients. Um, now, having said all this, having said that we believe that EU lawyers in England and Wales have retained all their key practicing rights, I don't mean by it that nothing has changed. There are very significant changes indeed affecting them. Um, I will group them into three big groups. Um, and you will see that the third of these bring us to the second part of my presentation, which pertains to requalification paths into the uh, solicitor's profession in England and Wales. Now, the first point, the first big change is that obviously, if a new lawyer is not either a British or an Irish citizen, they no longer have freedom of movement into the UK, but they are subject to the new point-based immigration system into the UK. Um, they are subject to it if they plan to move to the UK on a sort of permanent basis or for a long period of time. If they plan to move to the UK for a shorter period of time, and to provide advice to clients for a, for a limited period of time, then they might be covered by chapter four of the trade and cooperation agreement that the UK and the EU have signed. This chapter four covers mobility provisions. Stephanie has touched on them, so I'm not gonna um, repeat what she said. Uh, again, happy to, to answer questions of that, on them, although I have to say chapter four of the TCA, chapter four of, of uh, um, part two of the TCA is perhaps one of the most complex parts that affect the legal, well, that affect the services uh, sector in general. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions on them if there are questions. So, uh, immigration system, new immigration system, if you plan to move here, um, provisions under Chapter 4 of the TCA for shorter term business visitors. You will find in the material that there are links, the material in the, yeah, in the material connected to this webinar, that there are links to. Um, to websites where you can look into more details about what the new immigration systems into the UK involved. I'm not going to spend too much time on it now. Second big change, as I, and I mentioned this at the beginning of my presentation, EU lawyers in England and Wales can no longer register as REL's. Um, I'm just going to add this on what this means. REL's were able to practice not just home country law, EU law, international public law, but they were also able to, pra to practice English and Welsh reserved activities with certain limitations. Again, no point in going to the details of this because that's no longer in place. That's gone. 
And this, I want to say, is as a result of the, of the fact that the EU Lawyers Establishment Directive no longer applies to the UK. The third change pertains to the requalification paths as solicitors. And this brings me to the second part of my presentation. Until the end of last year, until the 31st of December 2020, EU lawyers who had registered in England and Wales as RELs and practiced continuously for three years, for at least three years, could requalify as solicitors through Article 10 of the EU Lawyers Establishment Directive. That is no longer possible, which means whoever hasn't applied for requalification as solicitor and met the three year uh, continuous practice requirement by the 31st of December 2020 can no longer use this path to requalification. Now, this doesn't mean that requalification as UK solicitors is no longer possible to EU citizens, Cypriot citizens or Cypriot lawyers. Um, there are other paths which makes it slightly more complex, but not impossible. Um, one path is the sort of traditional path, the so-called traditional path, which involves you going to university in the UK, getting a qualifying law degree, which is a degree which has certain criteria, which makes it a qualifying law degree. Um, and after that, uh, study a one year graduate diploma in law, GDL, another acronym, um, which, as I said, takes one academic year if studied full time. Another option is you go to a university in the UK, you don't study law, you study any subject, and um, and after that you do a, a one year, sorry, I mentioned the, G, the, the GDL, sorry, actually applies to this, this second path. The one year GDL applies if you haven't studied a qualifying uh, law degree at university. So you study any degree at uni, and then you do the one year uh, GDL course. If you have studied law at uni, you don't have to take the GDL, uh, you can go directly to the second part of the, of the qualification path, which is the legal practice course, the LPC, um, followed by a period of uh, recognized training, a training contract, um, which uh, involves you working as a trainee for a, for a firm or an organization which is authorized to take on trainees. Um, after that, uh, you can then um, essentially qualify as a um, solicitor. However, for those who are already qualified as lawyers somewhere else in the world, and certainly anywhere in the EU, uh, there is another route which is quicker, which involves you not having to, to, to take any degree out of any UK university, but simply sitting uh, one exam, which is called the Qualified Lawyers Transfer Scheme, QLTS, yet another acronym. People really love acronyms in, in England and Wales. Um, now, the conditions to sit the exam is simply that you need to be qualified as a lawyer in one jurisdiction which is recognized by the SRA, and all EU jurisdictions are. So if you are qualified, you sit the QLTS, um, which is divided into a multiple choice test uh, and an objective structure clinical examination part. The first one is theoretical, the second one tests your practical knowledge of, um, of the skills required to being a solicitor in England and Wales. And if you pass the QLTS, there are no other requirements, you can requalify as a solicitor. Now, unfortunately, as um, Stephanie mentioned at the beginning of, of, um, of this webinar today, um, as well as Brexit, as well as the challenges brought about by the pandemic, there is a third big um, change that is about to happen in England and Wales, um, which is the fact that, well, this is purely a co coincidence actually, um, nothing to do with Brexit, but from September 2021, a big reform of the legal qualification system in England and Wales is coming into force. We're moving from the path I described, which involved people having to, cert to take certain degrees at university and then do a training contract uh, and then the LPC. Um, we're moving from that to a new qualification exam, which is called the Solicitor's Qualifying Examination, SQE. This will replace both what I described as a traditional path to qualifying as a solicitor and the QLTS. So the QLTS will no longer exist 
as of September, nor will the traditional path three qualification, but they will be replaced by the SQE. Now, if you've already started qualifying through either of the routes I described, the traditional one and QLTS, nothing to worry, they will be in place during a transitional phase which will last a few years and will enable those who have started to complete their qualification process through either paths. Um, if you haven't, and if you plan to start your requalification process from September 2021, then you will need to seed the SQE. Now, the SQE means that there is just one qualification path. No matter where you studied, no matter what you studied, you have to seed the SQE. This, I'd say, offers quite a good opportunity for future law students uh, from abroad. Because again, it will not matter what you studied at uni. It will not matter where you studied at uni, as long as your qualification is recognized as a graduate equivalent qualification in the UK, you will be able to see the, the SQE. Um, now, very briefly, because I'm, I'm conscious of time and stuff, and I don't know how much time I've got. I'm, I'm guessing just a few minutes. Uh, I'm just yes, going to go. Yes, okay, 25 I'm not minutes to... have passed, but thank okay. you time, Marco. Okay, I'm just going to go very briefly because I guess there is no point in me going into the details of the structure of the SQE. You have the material in the in the course material. You will find links that describe in detail what the exam involves. There's no point in me going into details because you will probably have forgotten them ten minutes after the end of the webinar. So I'm just going to say what the requirements are for the SQE. So I said one is a degree level qualification or equivalent, which can have been taken in the UK or abroad as long as it's recognized as equivalent to a UK degree level qualification. You have to complete the SQE, which will have two stages, SQE1 and SQE2. You remember I said of the QLTS that it is divided into two stages. The first one is a multiple choice test, which is which tests your theoretical knowledge of the law. The second one is a more practical assessment. Well, the SQE will be divided roughly in the same way. So SQE1 will test your knowledge of the law, SQE2, your practical skills. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into details now unless there are questions on, on what these two parts entail. Third requirement, as well as seating SQE1 and SQE2, you will need to complete two years qualifying work experience. Now, this in some ways could be similar to a training contract uh, under the traditional qualification route, uh, but it can be something else. So you don't just have to, um, the only option is not to be a trainee in a law firm. There are many other ways to gain these two years qualifying work experience. You, for, for example, you could have been on a placement during your law degree or you, during your degree in any subject. You could have been working in a law clinic uh, in the UK. Uh, you could have been working as a voluntary in a, for a charitable, as a volunteer for a charitable organization. You could have worked as a paralegal or indeed you could have been on a training contract. Now, I have to say that because the SQE is not in place yet, we still don't know the full extent of what could qualify as a qualifying work experience. And I'm guessing an obvious question for someone who is studying law abroad is, can I do my qualifying work experience outside of the UK? And I guess that's a question that could be explored by uh, education providers and training providers abroad with the SRA in England and Wales. The last thing before I wrap up, and sorry, I'm getting some echo. I don't know if someone has turned their microphones on. OK, it's gone now. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is, what if you are already qualified as a lawyer somewhere else in the EU, including Cyprus? Well, you still have to see the, to seat the SQE. However, the SRA is in the process of assessing um, whether certain jurisdictions, certain foreign jurisdictions, uh, particularly those under common law systems might qualify for exemptions from parts of the SQE. Um, this assessment will be carried out by the SRA, which, as I said, is a separate organization to the Law Society. As Law Society, we made the point to the SRA that EU jurisdictions should be assessed first, should be given priority because of the changes that foreign, that EU lawyers in England and Wales have already been subject to. We want to make the path as easy as we can for them. 
uh, but this assessment is still underway. So as things stand, if you want to requalify as a solicitor in England Wells from September 2021 onwards, you will have to seat the SQE. Okay, that concludes my presentation. I appreciate it was very general in some parts, but I'm very happy to, to answer questions now. Thank you very Thank much, you Marco. Very much, Marco. This, this is very, very helpful, I think, for everyone who is listening. Actually, uh, we we probably already had this discussion. Um, you know, we actually at Euclid Cyprus Law School, we offer a qualifying law degree uh, that is recognized both uh, in the UK and in Cyprus. And in, in the UK, it's recognized by the SRA for long, as long as it goes. Um, uh, but also by the BSB, so the Bar Standards Board. So we, we are happy to, you know, um, listen to that and uh, looking at um, uh, other uh, avenues because as Claire Hose knows very well, we have a placement module, for example, on the LLB. We have multiple opportunities for internships and uh, clinics and so on. So uh, we have been following very closely the reform of the legal uh, of the of the legal education uh, by the SRA, and we have participated, Clarkos in particular, to public consultations and giving the overseas perspective. And we are doing this, of course, together with your clan in the UK. Uh, so uh, we are we are right um, right on point. So uh, thank you for this. Now I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions and. Um, People are welcome, participants are welcome to use the chat to ask questions right now if they want to. If there is a burning need to take the floor and uh, use the microphone, you're welcome to do that as well. So the floor is open for questions. If not, then either Claire Hoss or I can, I can ask questions. Stephanie, hi, it's Ana Maria Vasiliadis. How are you? Hi, Ana Maria. Fine, thank you. We are listening to you. Um, my question is basically, although I have read a little bit about it, my question is um, qualified solicitors or barristers that practice in Cyprus and uh, or registered European lawyers that practice in the UK. So qualified lawyers in Cyprus that practice in the UK under the registered European lawyers, which obviously was in place before Brexit. How will this continue? What, what does it, has the UK taken any measures or has it reached any agreements with probably the Commonwealth countries where the common law is applied um, on how the recognition of these qualifications of this academic um, professional qualifications will count uh, moving forward? Okay, Anna Maria, thank you. I think the question is for Marco. I, I developed it a little bit at the beginning during the chair's briefing. So yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't to... able to log in in the beginning. It's so. okay. I know, don't worry. So you can listen to the beginning of the recording, but if Marco sure. could give perhaps some elements of answer, that would be very much appreciated. Sure. So can I just check, Anna Maria, are you referring to you said qualified solicitors, right? So we're talking about the recognition of the qualification rather than the Yes, so the for example, yes, yeah, so for example, myself, I'm a qualified solicitor. I entered the Cyprus legal profession as a qualified solicitor and registered as a, a registered European lawyer, which after three years, I was able to transport it to being a Cyprus advocate. So obviously a solicitor coming from the UK, following the route that you just described, coming back to Cyprus to practice law, would no longer be able to register under the registered European lawyer scheme, which would have derived from the UK being into EU and therefore um, would have no other option but to seek the Cyprus bar exam. So I'm just wondering whether the UK has taken any measures um, to, to, to fill in that gap. Um, otherwise, I would have assumed that the any, any practicing solicitors that would come back to Cyprus following their qualification would have to take the Cyprus bar exams in order to be admitted as advocates of the Republic or um, continue to practice under their title, but this wouldn't be recognizable under uh, the Cyprus Bar Association. So, yes, um, so the, the interesting bit on, on this, uh, and uh, again, there is a, some irony to it, is that actually the impact uh, of, uh, of Brexit for practicing lawyers is 
going to be felt a lot more by UK solicitors practicing in the EU than it will be by EU lawyers practicing in England and Wales. Because the system we have in England and Wales is such that even, I mean, we the SRA doesn't even need to recognize the qualification under which you're practicing as long as you're not giving advice to clients in any of the six reserved activities you can practice under your home title in England and Wales. Again, this is subject to the new immigration system if you want to move to England and Wales or to the mobility provisions under the TCA if you want to temporarily come here to give advice to clients for, for a few months. Mm -hmm. Now, the situation is a lot more complex if you are a UK solicitor who moves to Cyprus now because as you said, you can no longer register as a REL in Cyprus um, the European Lawyers List in Cyprus. Um, I, my understanding is that under your solicitor's professional title, you cannot really give advice on Cyprus. You don't have many practicing rights, but I'm guessing Stephanie and Clearcos are probably more of an expert than me on, on this. Um, and yes, indeed, if you want to requalify at the moment, if you want to requalify as a Cypriot lawyer, you need to see the bar exam. There is no recognition, automatic recognition of qualifications. Now, the, C the TCA, as Stephanie said, the, the EU-UK trade deal, has some provisions for the recognition of professional qualifications. But it will be quite a long process to put them in, in practice because what the TCA has is simply provisions to allow regulatory bodies in the UK and the EU to put in place systems for the recognition of professional qualifications. So the deal itself does not mean that the solicitor's qualification is recognized across the EU. What the deal does have is the principle of home title practice, but the problem is that you need to look at what reservations Cyprus has scheduled under the deal which means Cyprus can still say we actually have further conditions before solicitors can practice here, before UK solicitors can practice here. Now, the, the, the last thing I want to say is that if you have already requalified, so if you requalified in Cyprus as a Cypriot lawyer before the end of the transition period, that qualification stays because that's protected by the withdrawal agreement, which was signed back uh, at the end of 2019. So if you requalified by the end of 2020, as either a UK solicitor or a CPR lawyer, that qualification stays. It's not taken away from you. But if you haven't, then you are in, under this new regime, which means the SQE, if you want to requalify as a solicitor in England and Wales, and the CPR bar exam, if you want to requalify in Cyprus. But again, Stephanie is the expert on that. So probably that's something that, that maybe you can cover in more details as far as Cyprus is concerned. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Uh, I'm clear about this, so I would have. I, I would. I will hope that the Cyprus Bar Association would put something into place so that it can accommodate uh, the solicitors. I know it wasn't the practice in the past to have many practicing solicitors move to Cyprus, but uh, from my experience and in my generation, I think we do have quite a lot coming back uh, now due to COVID as well, coming back yes. to Cyprus to practice, and it it, it ideally wouldn't be uh, perfect for them to just sit the bar exams again given that they already have a qualification in place. So hopefully the Cyprus Bar Association will, will manage to put something in place. I think, Anna Maria, you touched upon something very important. Uh, we have had, you know, uh, solicitors coming back and uh, a long time ago over, over the past few years and, and you know, getting uh, um, their registration in Cyprus. We have had uh, solicitors uh, converting uh, the professional qualifications in the UK into uh, professional qualifications in Cyprus prior to the expiry of the transitional period. But you're right that there is a whole new category of service providers, of legal service providers affected by the pandemic, which means that we're going to have more and more of such people. And you're right about that. Now, can I ask, before I give the floor to Clarkos, can I ask if Pandelis is with us? I, I can see he's there on the list of participants, but are you actually uh, available to speak, Pandelis? Christophidis? No? 
because I wanted to come back to uh, that example that we have, Marco, and this is relevant to what Ana Maria was just discussing. I mean, we have an example already of joint statement uh, for joint examinations between the, the, the professional body um, of the chartered accountants in the UK and in Cyprus. So we already have a good example of good practice, good example of best practice uh, as far as the profession of chartered accountants is concerned. I referred to it in the in the chess briefing and I know that Bandelis was involved in this. That's why I was asking whether he was available. Um, so we have uh, and I we can we can share it. It's freely available on uh, I think on the Internet. I think I found it on the Internet. Uh, the joint examination scheme between the ICPAC, which is the Institute uh, of, uh, of Public um, uh, Accountants uh, in Cyprus, but and with the equivalent body in England and Wales, the ICAEW. This, this joint statement and joint agreement uh, is currently subject to approval by the Cyprus Public Audit Oversight Board of the Republic of Cyprus, but I think this shows the way uh, that the Cyprus Bar Association could engage uh, into together with the with the law society in particular. Uh, why am I saying with the law society in particular and the SRA? It's because as far as the barristers are concerned, then things are more straightforward in the sense that there is no uh, change to the there is no legal reform to the uh, to the profession. So, for example, uh, the law degree, the LLB that we offer at uh, UCLAN Cyprus is still a qualifying law degree as far as the BSB, uh, the Bass Standard Board, is, is concerned. So the main issue is with the solicitors, really. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's an example, and I think it should be uh, borne in mind, and lawyers, registered lawyers in Cyprus, should bring it up to the attention of the Cyprus Bar Association. I can see that Bandelis is here. Please repeat the query. I had certain technical connectivity problems. OK, Bandelis, do you want to come online? Is it possible for you to actually? Yes. Hello, Good. Stephanie. How are you? Hi, Bandelis. Hello. Uh, so for everybody's um, uh, information, I was talking about uh, what we discussed before Christmas, which was the joint uh, examination scheme between the ICPAC and the ICAEW saying that uh, the Cyprus Bar Association could engage in something similar. Can you give us some, some sort of information or maybe um, comments on that? Well, um, we are acting as uh, external legal consultants of ICPAC, the only recognized uh, auditor's body in, in Cyprus under the auditor's laws of 2017 until 2020. Um, the ICPAC and ICAW had reached a joint commitment statement as to their will to conclude a draft uh, agreement and that had been notified um, during early in December 2020. The competent under the auditor's laws uh, authority of the Republic of Cyprus, which is the Cyprus Public Oversight Board, uh, CPAO, in Greek Adelep. Uh, and um, it is pending examination by the said uh, body. Uh, there is currently um, um, uh, this uh, fact has been published by ICPAC with an announcement at its website, which is publicly accessible for reasons of transparency. And it had also been uh, on various uh, social media. It is, of course, um, a proposed agreement which relates to a joint examination scheme and uh, by all means as also uh, stated um, uh, by uh, previously by various speakers uh, this will uh, this current legal situation created by the draft agreement the draft tca should be by the competent authorities of the Republic of Cyprus, along, of course, uh, Stephanie, with the competent authorities of our family, of the European Union. Uh, we are yes. still not alone. <laughs> um, accordingly, uh, we are uh, waiting for uh, the reply of the Cypriot authorities 
uh, take into account uh, both EU law and national law to that effect. Uh, I will agree, however, with you that uh, HAC acting always within the spirit of EU law, the primary law, and of course the Republic of Cyprus law, sorry for that, uh, would be um, in the forefront for any cooperation permissible under EU law uh, so as to enhance uh, the provision of services within the Union. Thank you very much, Pandelis. I think, you know, uh, as I said, it's good for uh, qualified lawyers in Cyprus, um, perhaps if you need our, our help as well as academics to, you know, uh, give a strong message to the Cyprus Bar Association and, uh, and, and, and put um, some pressure so that um, uh, this, can be, this can be achieved uh, in the name of the very strong tides between the UK and Cyprus and the Republic of Cyprus. Claire, here you had your hand up. If, 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 I could, if I could add to that, it could be the case that the Cyprus Bar Association, that's a suggestion, a personal suggestion. The Cyprus Bar Association can get together with the SRA and with the Bar Council so as to put uh, so as to put in front of the uh, Partnership Council and the competent committee and joint recommendation, of course, along with the uh, competent authority, which is the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Cyprus and the Legal Council of the Republic okay. and their counterparts in the UK. Uh, so uh, putting forward uh, this idea, uh, of course, some justification, detailed justification under the respective annex. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to help you put that together, Bandelis. I know that a lot of uh, new and young lawyers were appointed to different the different committees of the Cyprus Bar Association and uh, have entered into uh, uh, communication and consultation with the uh, Cyprus Legal Council. So um, it's probably the right time to, you know, uh, also engineer uh, new ways of working. I see that our rector is with us uh, and uh, he has put a small note in the in the chat. So thank you very much, rector. Would you like to say something or perhaps he's gone already because he was very patient. Maybe he's gone already. Um, Claire, you have your hand up. Is there is there something you would like to add or ask? Yes. Um... Let me share the screen, if I may, just for one second. Right, there's a specific, let me make a, a specific point and then a general point. Here we are. There is one provision in the withdrawal agreement, not the withdrawal agreement, the um, EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement. Let me just find the relevant, there it is. That's on page four. Now, let me be careful here. On the page is that there are various different editions of the uh, trade and cooperation agreement. The e UK version has one numbering scheme. The EU version has another numbering scheme. I think that I've used here the EU numbering scheme. There's an unnumbered reservation on page 571 of the EU UK trade and cooperation agreement. It states, with respect to inve investment liberalisation, market access, national treatment and cross-border trading services, national treatment, blah, blah, blah. In CY, a term defined on page 558 as Cyprus, EEA, European Economic Area, or Swiss nationality, as well as residency, brackets, commercial presence, is required. Only advocates enrolled in the bar may be partners or shareholders or members of the board of directors in a law company in Cyprus. This is what happens when you rush. That's a not very well phrased a reservation. It hasn't been put through any process of uh, line by line, word by word, uh, letter by letter scrutiny. It's open to interpretation in a number of respects. And this reinforces the point that I've been making that there should have been much closer public consultation throughout the Brexit process. The discussion that I've just heard over the last five minutes is very important and interesting, but it's something, all of these discussions should have been had before um, Brexit took place in its two phases. We're now dealing with after the event scenarios. 
we're dealing with provisions that are that are set in stone. They may be subject to amendment uh, as the future unfolds. So I'm, I'm just going to make a recommendation here. The Cyprus Bar Association, together with the Cyprus government, uh, need to um, do two things, among other things. The first thing they need to do is to start issuing proper guidance notes to practicing lawyers in the way that the Law Society has done and to some extent the UK government have done uh, in, in England and Wales. So the, that's the first thing they need to do. They need to issue proper guidance documents and publish them on their respective websites so that there is clarity as to what the position is with regard to the legal profession. Uh, and the second thing that needs to happen is that um, there mustn't be a repetition of what's happened over the last two or three years where there's, there's been this silence in Cyprus and this reluctance to engage with Brexit. Brexit is not over. There are, there are going to be a number of additional agreements and understandings reached as time goes by in order to put flesh on some of these um, agreements that have been reached. And the Cyprus Bar Association as a collective body needs to be at the forefront uh, of those efforts. And I know there's a new there's a new regime in place in the Cyprus Bar Association, and, and I would just urge that new regime to, to be very proactive in, in this, this process as it unfolds. Because as I said earlier, the, the Republic of Cyprus, with the exception of Ireland, is the sovereign state in the EU that is more heavily affected by Brexit um, than any other. So I'll come off the I'll come off the, uh, the screen there. Thank you, Clarke. That's very helpful. Actually, I would encourage uh, everyone. After all, we are all lawyers here to have a look at um, Annex Four, Five, and Six of the uh, so-called Servine. So this is the way uh, the EU, uh, um, UK um, um, TCA is, is referenced. It has uh, lots of parts and subparts and uh, in the Servine part of the, uh, of, the, of the agreement, you will find uh, multiple reservations by member states uh, in the field of services. Uh, in Annex 456, and uh, there are some, uh, yes, uh, there are reservations by Cyprus, and this is why I mentioned in the in the in the chair's brief that yes, there may be implications on the own ownership of um, of legal practice, or the management of legal practice, or the actual practice itself of legal advice, and that requires a, a, a good reading of the agreement itself, which is not easy. So I fully agree with Kierkegaard's um, proposal that uh, there should be a clear guideline uh, guidance from uh, the government and the various ministries, and that sh this should have been done beforehand. Let's hope that we get more and more um, certainty and clarity over this agreement, which for the moment is clearly only addressed to uh, experts and technocrats, because it was actually written by technocrats. You can tell from the very wording of, of, of the bar, of the bar exception, that it's it's written by non-lawyers, but technocrats. Uh, Pandelis, you have your hand up, and Marco also. So let's start with Marco, and and then maybe Pandelis can jump in. Marco. I mean, to be fair, Pandelis raised his hand first, so I don't know if, uh, if I want to go first. So, no, Thank please, Marco. Okay, no, very briefly. Thank you. No, th so just very briefly, j just to to add to what Clerk just just said. I mean, um, indeed, this is the, the reservation scheduled by Cyprus, which uh, I, I I didn't have in mind when I made my presentation. But that's a typical example of the situation that I described before. So there is this general commitment to enable lawyers from one party to provide legal services under home title into the territory of the other party, but then. There are reservations such as this, which basically nullify the general commitment. Because how many UK lawyers will have EU nationality? We, we don't know, but obviously the vast majority we can expect they won't have it. So basically, this reservation, this condition that Cyprus has attached to the general commitment to enable UK lawyers to practice law in Cyprus, and obviously Cyprus is perfectly free, free to make this reservation. It's in its right to make the reservation, but that basically means that that general commitment under Section 7 basically doesn't apply in the territory of Cyprus, except for those UK lawyers who are EEA citizens. And last point, I completely agree with clear The problem was the speed at which this had to be negotiated, because we had an incredible 
I would say success from our perspective that there was that provision on home title practice in the text of the agreement, uh, which is an important success for the influencer work we have been making for years on behalf of, of the profession. But then because there was no time to negotiate on the national reservations, very often that general provision is made well, is severely limited in a number of EU member states as a result. And then, as Anna Maria said, the problem is that then someone who is qualified as a UK solicitor and wants to practice in Cyprus now, because of that reservation, well, maybe, no, if they are Cypriot citizen, then maybe not, but if they're not, then it's severely limited in what the TCA means for them in practice. So yes, last point, I will very much welcome guidance from the Cyprus side as well. We at Lost Society will very much welcome that because we know we have a number of solicitors who are either practicing or want to practice in Cyprus and they will very much benefit from such guidance. Uh, Thank you, Marco. Pandelis. I completely agree with Marco and I would add that this is not the only problem. Unfortunately, certain not regulated sectors in Cyprus have been inserted in the TCA with the specific name, I cannot say more, of the Cypriot legislation and thereby making the case that those sectors are regulated and hence excluded from the general operation of the treaty. Uh, and I agree with you that the state and uh, at the level of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, with the cooperation of other competent ministries and authorities, must revisit the legal text and uh, send a communique to the European Commission within the ambit of the final provisions and thereby rectify any error in law, which in this case are errors in law, prior to the execution date in February, not the April long stop date mentioned in, in the TCA. Uh, a second comment will be that we must always uh, take care um, of abiding by the CJU case law, including the Singapore case, the Singapore opinion. We should always remember that in this case, the EU has exercised its jurisdiction and we must solve this issue at that level, i.e. of the European Commission, but not jumping into any unilateral action which could be contrary to EU law. Uh, as correctly stated, uh, there are two parties in this uh, process, the EU and the UK, and the agreement itself is governed under international law. But the relationship as between the member states, the component elements of the union family are us. And we are bound by the intra-family EU rules. Uh, and having this in mind, I agree with your suggestions that the uh, competent authorities of the Republic of Cyprus, after due consultation with the EU Commission, should provide uh, further um, guidance on the operation of the relevant provisions, but after any errors in law have been effectively rectified. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bandeli. Thank you for uh, you know providing some uh, good conclusions. Uh, I would like to remind the lawyers, the practicing lawyers on the webinar, that in order for you to get your CPD points, you must provide us with information uh, regarding your registration as lawyers. So uh, Despina and Andrea, uh, our colleague at the school, um, academics at the school have already uh, sent you um, a, a list of, uh, of questions uh, because the Cyprus Bar Association is changing the way it is actually uh, validating or evaluating uh, points, CPD points. So we need to have those information for all lawyers if they want to get their CPD points. Now, it's seven o'clock and uh, I think we have had a good two hour chat uh, and I don't think we should extend it further. We are all busy and uh, have uh, you know uh, other things to do at this time of the day. 
I think we can call it off now and uh, reflect uh, on uh, you know, our each of uh, our sides. There is a lot that can be done. There is a lot that can be improved. Um, this idea of, you know, uh, correcting uh, legal errors is definitely a very important one. And um, also, Marco, you know, I think you have given a lot of food for thought to young people as well. So this is very important. We have lots of young uh, professionals, future professionals here. Uh, so we are very happy and uh, grateful for them. We are grateful for everyone to have spent the past two hours with us, uh, for the practicing lawyers to have brought their expertise in, and for academics to have uh, supported the event and uh, all our um, colleagues, other colleagues, administration, but also IT, because without them, we wouldn't be able to do uh, so, so nice webinars. So thank you everyone for your time. Um, Whoever is not at home, uh, I wish you a very safe journey home. But I think most of us, unfortunately, are at home uh, under lockdown situation. And um, we wish you all the best and uh, we'll be soon in contact for perhaps a follow up webinar on a similar issue. Marco, thank you so much for your time. Claire, the same to you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Bye. You take care. Stay safe. You do. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.